Hello listeners, and welcome to Stories in the Dark. So one quick update. This is the second to last episode of Demons Season. So this week we have a story called Three Nights in the Desert. And then after this, in two weeks, it will be the last Demons episode. So I hope you stay with us and I hope you've been enjoying this season. Start thinking about what you think might be a good theme for season three. Because while we're on hiatus, as always, I will be working on the content for the next season. And as of yet, we haven't picked a theme. So I would love your help. If you are watching us on YouTube, go ahead and leave us a comment what you think might be a fun theme for the next season or you can always find us on Twitter or Instagram and you can leave us a little note and let us know what you think. And don't forget to check out our Patreon. You can become a patron of Stories in the Dark. And while we are on hiatus after the next episode, you can drop in and check us out because we will still be updating there. All right, I hope you're ready for three nights in the desert. I went to the desert to find my sister. I went to the desert to die alone. Shula had always loved the desert, the dry, dry air and the whispering sands and the desiccated plants and the life that hides from the blistering sun. Everything is stronger there, she told me the night before she left, sitting on the edge of my bed, braiding her long black hair, her deft fingers weaving the strands of her hair, while the spring rains turned everything outside to mud. Shula was older and it showed, I was jealous of her thin fingers and golden skin. I felt pasty and pale and chubby and messy next to my sister. My braids were not as nice. My room was too cluttered. I stared at the mold creeping in the windowsills while she told me her plan. She would take her old Subaru down the interstate from Oregon to California and finally to Arizona, alone. Why must you always do the odd thing? Our mother asked her, frustrated, tidy like Shula in her work clothes, laptop open in front of her. Why don't you go to Europe with your friends or go intern at a good company? Why the desert? But Shula said only that the desert called her and she must answer. Our mother made the pinched face that said everything she wouldn't say out loud. I went to my room and closed the door and ate some sweets in bed. In the morning, Shula was gone along with her car and a backpack full of clothes. She left me a note an actual handwritten note. Not a text message, not a Snapchat. This place is giving me a fungus, she said, her handwriting scratchy but neat. I need to go where it's dry. I need to bake in the sun like clay, like the sand of the desert. Be good, Shubu, be wise. This is just like my sister, I thought, and wadded up the note. Then I opened it back up and tried to smooth out the lines. It was too crumpled. I cleared a space on my desk and flattened it out, and then set a book on top, pressing it down. Maybe it would be like new again. For a week, my sister sent me pictures. Cheap hotel signs awful rooms, 
a bird flying across the road. The winding roads of central California, the hills with windmills and grass just starting to turn yellow. Her feet in the sand, but not the sandy beaches of the coast, not for Shula. She hated the water. She drove inland and found the dry parts. She found the dust and the dry sand of Palm Desert. And then she kept going to the Mojave. It's beautiful here, she texted me, along with a picture of a fire she built in the desert at night. It didn't look beautiful to me. And then the pictures changed. No more cheap hotels, no more whimsical roadside fruit stands, no more pictures of postcards. Instead, she sent me dry white rocks, warped cacti, short and spiny and weird, bleached white wood, tumbleweeds and barbed wire, her long brown toes digging into the sand and the dirt, black and white photos of endless sand, sepia photos of sand, and then a selfie of her face, all cheekbones and huge eyes. She looked like she wasn't eating. She looked dried out and hot. Her eyes were blazing as if with fever. The Mojave isn't quite right, she said in her last text. There's something missing. I'm going to go south and east. Be good. After that, she sent pictures, but no words. She sent pictures, but not of her face. Her sleeping bag in the sand. A dead crow in the road. A fire burnt down to ashes. In the pictures, the sand went from white and yellow to orange. The rocks turned red. The desert turned into hills and scrubby trees and ugly bushes. The sun burned away everything until the sky was blue and white and everything below looked like it was on fire. According to Shula's pictures, the whole world was a desert and I felt alone in my moldy room in the rain of the Pacific Northwest. While in the world of Shula's pictures, everything burned to dust. And then, two weeks after she left, the pictures stopped. I waited a day, then two days. I texted her, I called her, nothing. I asked my mother if she'd heard from Shula and she just shook her head and told me she had to work. But she drank two glasses of red wine, so I knew she was worried too. I got on Shula's computer and used the find my phone thing. It showed somewhere in Arizona right on the border of New Mexico. While I was watching the app, her phone disappeared. After that, my calls went straight to voicemail and my texts turned green instead of blue. Her phone was off. That's when I got scared. I panicked. I went to my mom's wallet and I took out her credit card and her license. I bought a plane ticket to Arizona and used my mom's ID to get on the flight to Phoenix. I had never flown by myself before. I'd never gone anywhere without my mom or my sister. I avoided people's eyes, thinking they might know. I didn't like how the men in the airport looked at me. I couldn't wait to find my sister. She was my armor out in the world. 
In Phoenix, I rented a car using my mom's account and her ID. No one looked closely at me. No one cared. I bought bags of snacks and jugs of water and finally responded to my mother's text messages. I'm fine, I lied. I'm looking for Shula. Don't cancel the credit card. I need it for gas. I knew how she thought. If she canceled the card, she would force me to come back. I had taken some cash too, but I was terrified that if she canceled the card, I'd get stuck somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. The air was so dry. I had to constantly drink water and my eyes felt sticky. The sun was trying to suck every drop of moisture out of me. The dust in the air made me cough and I longed for the green and the wet and the damp of my home as I put sunscreen on my face and arms. Even with the air conditioning on in the car, I was sweating too much. I stopped and bought Gatorade, the green one, and dried mango. The guy at the counter stared at my sweaty t-shirt and I hurried back to my car, away from his eyes, and I kept driving. I entered the Gila National Forest when the sun was getting low in the sky and the air was starting to turn as red as the hills. I'd stopped checking directions a while back. I knew where to go. I knew I would just keep driving east until I found my sister. When it was almost full dark, I pulled over. I'd stopped seeing other cars over an hour ago. It was just me in the empty road in the dusk falling over the sand and the strange scrubby trees. When I opened the car door, the heat hit me like a wave. Like when you open the oven and the heat comes out and slaps you in the face. I grabbed my backpack and sleeping bag and a bag of stuff from the store and started walking into the desert. The air was still and silent as the sun finished setting below the hills. I had a flashlight, but I didn't need it. The moon came out and the stars lit up the night and everything was silver sand as far as I could see. I walked the way my sister would. I walked out into the emptiness. The sand became a sea that bore me away. I felt like I would never see the shore again. I walked until the night grew too cold. The chill settled into my bones and my clothes rubbed against the dried sweat on my skin, and I knew I had to stop. I sank down into the sand and rolled myself up in my sleeping bag until I was warm enough to sleep. I dreamed of my sister. She was calling to me through a wall of glass. She was telling me to stay away. This isn't for you, she said. And I knew that feeling. I knew rejection all over again. The boy who didn't ask me to dance. The sister who left without me. Go home, Shubu, she said, and walked away into the sky. When I woke the next morning, sweaty and tangled in my sleeping bag. She was sitting by the fire, a fire she must have built. She stirred the logs with a stick and her face was blank. When I sat up, she looked at me, a look I did not know. I felt afraid of her, but only for a moment. Shula, I cried and sat up. 
I felt heavy and slow, my eyes crusted with sleep. Her eyes softened and she set down the stick. Shubu, why did you come? She asked and she looked sad. Your phone stopped working and I was worried. Why are you still out here? Did your car break down? As soon as I asked, I knew it was a stupid question. Her car wasn't there. She shook her head. You need to leave, Shubu. It isn't safe for you here. The sun beat down on my head and I felt faint. I crawled out of the sleeping bag and drank some water. I offered her a bottle of water and she took it but didn't drink. A shadow passed between us. My car isn't far, I told her. We can leave right now. I have mom's credit card. We can fly home together. She didn't say anything. Come with me, Shula. She looked away from me. I cannot leave and you cannot stay. I found what I was looking for. This is where I belong, but you do not. You must go. And that is all she would say. She would not eat or drink. When I asked about her car, her phone, she did not answer. When I asked where she'd been sleeping, she just waved at the desert. She was not herself, and I began to worry. Perhaps she had gone mad in the sun. Perhaps she'd always been a little mad. I took out my phone to call our mom, but I had no signal. She watched me without saying anything, and then when I walked off a ways to find somewhere to go to the bathroom, she left. This time, she didn't leave a note. I walked back to the rental car and drove until I had a signal. I called my mother, but she didn't answer. I sent her a text message and saw she had texted me a bunch of messages, telling me to come home. Her last text said she was on her way to Phoenix and to meet her there. I texted back that I had found Shula, but she was acting so strange. I said I was going back to the desert to see if I could find her again. And then I drove back, stopping off at another store on the way. I needed more supplies. The signal must have come and gone a few times because when I parked, I had another text from my mom. Stay away from Shula. Don't go back into the desert. Meet me in Phoenix. I texted back one word, no, but it just sat there. I opened my new umbrella and used it for shade as I walked back through the sand, my shoes heavy. I found the place where I'd slept and I sat and waited. The fire had burned all the way out and the wood had turned to ashes, but a few coals still smoked. I heard a bird caw in the distance, but I didn't see anyone or anything. I had never felt so alone. I tried to stay in the shade and I put sunscreen on constantly. I drank water straight from the jug. It tasted of plastic and it was almost too hot to drink. I longed for the spring rains of home and I wondered why my sister had really come here. The sun bleached everything to white. I was worried about my eyes. Even with dark glasses, everything was bright white. As the sun set for the second time, I saw vultures circling in the distance. 
I knew the desert had its own ecosystem, its own hidden realm of animal life, but I couldn't imagine anything living out here. It looked like the realm of the dead. I had picked up firewood at the store and I built my own fire when the air started to cool. I used Shula's stick to stir the logs while I ate junk food and tried to pretend I was camping. I must have fallen asleep by the fire. When I opened my eyes, she was there, squatting on the other side of the fire, her eyes dark and heavy. Come with me, Shula, I said. I was tired. She shook her head. I walked around the fire and grabbed her arm. This is crazy. You can't live out here. Come home with me. She was so thin and her skin burned my hand where I touched her. She shrugged me off and scuttled backward away from the fire. Even in the moonlight, she was hard to see. It must have been an effect of the fire but she was a little blurry around the edges. I stepped closer and she hissed at me like an animal. I didn't know what to do. Shula, I said, and I started to cry. She came closer again and stroked my arm with her long, thin fingers. Little sis she said and my skin crawled I tried to give her food but she didn't want it she refused water too you have to eat I said tears still in my voice I was so afraid for her I have food over there she said and pointed come with me her eyes glittered in the dark. I shook my head. I don't want to walk in the desert at night, I told her. I want to stay by the fire. She left, and I wondered if I'd been dreaming. I felt so hot in the cold. None of this felt real. But I dreamed of her again. You have to go, she said, and her eyes were sad. You cannot spend a third night in the desert. It isn't safe. I tried to hug her in my dream, but she wasn't there. She was missed. When I woke again, the fire was out. The sun was high, and I knew I had to walk further into the sand. I packed up my backpack in bags and walked in the direction she'd pointed, or at least I hoped it was the same direction. It was hard to tell. I saw the vultures circling again. I walked for hours, my feet swollen and sweating in my shoes, umbrella held over my head. I was on my last jug of water. I couldn't carry much more with me. The vultures were my guide. I followed them through the featureless sand, dizzy and tired and scared, till I saw something. I started running, my feet slipping, mouth dry, and as I got closer I could see it. Shula's Subaru blackened and burnt in the sand. Her backpack and clothes were scattered and the vultures were there too, covering something, feeding. The sand was stained darker, splotchy and brown. I didn't want to see what they were hiding, but I tripped and they scattered, flapping off a few feet and I saw bones and some hair and clothes. Shula's hair still braided. Shula's clothes, her jeans and white shirt. 
her body in the sand, dead at least a few days, picked over by vultures. I leaned over and threw up. The vultures watched me, curious, and then they flapped closer to her body again. I wiped my mouth and ran at them, screaming, and they flew away, but they didn't go far. I sat down in the sand next to her and cried. When I finished crying, she was standing next to me, just as I'd seen her the last two days. She was wearing the same jeans, the same white shirt. She had the same long, loose braid. Her eyes were curious as I wiped my face. She didn't like water. The sun will go down soon, she said, and I shook my head. It wasn't time yet. But she was right. The sky was turning red. You need to leave. Her teeth were longer than I remembered. Her fingers, too. They almost looked like claws. We get so hungry out here, she said, her voice low and quiet. Let me bury her, I said. There's no time, she whispered. She was right. I could see them coming closer as the air turned chill and the sun set, shadows walking across the sand. I'll be okay, I told her. You don't have to worry about me anymore. I took the can out of my bag and poured the oil on her body. And then I lit a match and set my sister's body on fire. The vultures screamed in the distance as she started to burn. And when I turned, she was still there, eyes wide and dry, clawed fist held up to her mouth. She looked like she wanted to cry, but couldn't. She looked like it hurt. Run, she said as the other things like her drew closer. Run, little sister, she hissed, and her slitted eyes turned towards me as she reached for me with her long fingers. And I did. I hope you enjoyed our story this week. I thought of it because I googled desert demons. I had the desert on my mind and I was looking for something to inspire me. And so I researched some lore as I do sometimes for inspiration. And I found that there was a type of demon in the desert that will lure you in with visions and promises of oases and all the things that you could be dreaming of out there in the dry sand. And the demon kills you, and it takes your form. And it uses that to lure in more prey. And I thought about two sisters and what it would be like for one of them to want to lose herself in the desert. And when she does, she gets found by a demon. And her other sister loves her sister so much that she just can't let her go. And so she goes to find her. And I think that when you love someone, that's what you do. You go find them and you go and you try to save them, even if they can't be saved anymore. Because she couldn't. Shula was gone. She wasn't there. And so Shubu is dreaming of her sister. And it's almost as if her sister's spirit is trying to warn her away. But in the waking world, the demon is trying to lure her in. Except that I thought, what if this demon can take your form for a while, but there's also still a little bit of you there in the form that it takes. And so in the waking world, the demon is both trying to lure 
Shubu in, but it's also trying to warn her away, that little piece of it that's still her sister. And so the demon is very conflicted and the others like it come and it wants to save Shubu, but it also wants to eat her too. Because I think that must be like what it's like to be a demon. I think that you have your baser nature and then sometimes you get a little glimpse of the light. I don't see Caesar in your contacts. Should I look for businesses with that name? No. Okay. So that's our story this week. The story of a desert demon that eats a girl and her sister comes to find her. And I will leave it up to you to decide if Shubu makes it out of the desert alive. I don't really know what happens after our story ends. I do know that I love our theme this season. I love the demons. I just obviously do. And I hope you do too. I'll see you next time. It's stories in the dark.